Hello, welcome to another virtual program with Maine Historical Society. It is July 20th, 2021. I'm Kathleen Newman, and this is Major Episodes of Colonial Racism in Maine State Indian History and Policy with Dr. Darren Ranko. This talk is one of a series uh, for Begin Again, our exhibit at Maine Historical Society. This series will examine the different stories and different themes that are explored in that exhibit. If you'd like to know more about how you can visit the exhibit in person or virtually, please visit our website, mainhistory.org to learn more and to purchase tickets. Darren Ranko is a citizen of the Penobscot Nation and Associate Professor of Anthropology and Chair of Native American Programs at the University of Maine. He has a Master's of Studies in Environmental Law from Vermont Law School and a PhD in Social Anthropology from Harvard University. His research focuses on the ways in which indigenous communities in the United States resist environmental destruction by using indigenous science, diplomacies, and critiques of liberalism to protect natural and cultural resources. He teaches classes on indigenous intellectual property rights, research ethics, environmental justice, and tribal governance. He is particularly interested in how better research relationships can be made between universities, museums, native and non-native researchers, and indigenous communities. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Renko, for being with us this evening. Thank you so much. And uh, um, really, really honored to be joining you all. And I see in the attendees, of which there are now almost 100 of you, um, several of you know, know me and have heard me speak before. And um, part of what I want to say is, you know, I'm, I'm I'm zooming in from a place uh, I call Neheme Benage, which is Turkey Hill here in Dedham um, in my own territory and um, as a Penobscot Nation citizen. And I just, it, it's such an honor to kind of be in my own territory, try to illuminate and tell um, difficult uh, stories that, that collectively unite us, but also create um, possibilities for a more just relations uh, uh, amongst us. So sort of my <laughs> thesis statement of, of being with you this evening. And I'll, I'll also uh, share my screen. Um, let's see here. It's only been a year and a half. So maybe I can master the, the sharing of the screen. So here is title slide, uh, Major Episodes of Colonial Racism. And um, I have given um, versions of this talk and parts, especially the first half, um, partly uh, as Kathleen remembers in support of our redact, the redact exhibit at Maine Historical, um, because I'm gonna touch a little bit on that, not very much, um, but then really trying to understand that context because it, it definitely is part of this overall history. Um, and I've also given kind of a dry run of this to, in support of LD291 for the, the, I don't know, 15 or 20 teachers and, and other folks who attended um, a couple Saturdays ago, a, um, a training for teachers in support of uh, the Maine Indian History and Culture Law, um, which requires you know, main teachers to teach main Indian culture and history. I presented a kind of dry run of this. So uh, if anyone has seen some of these slides before, or if you were one of those lucky teachers, you might've seen almost all of them. <laughs> I have, I have uh, modified it even since then. So I am, I feel quite, actually quite privileged to be able to tell the stories again. And I think a number of us have really seized upon, including Maine Historical Society, have seized upon the opportunity of the sort of 200 years of Maine to kind of illuminate and, and create deeper uh, uh, and more contextual histories of, of um, what is sort of collectively kind of um, bound us in, in together in the state of Maine and particularly, you know, the state of Maine as, as a thing that has happened and continues to happen to us as Wabanaki people. So the goals of today, um, I will talk about the sort of key dates and episodes, and I have a slide so that people can see sort of 
how I weave, you know, major major episodes in this um, Maine Indian history and policy, and also talk a little bit about key concepts related to the state of Maine Indian history and policy, and um, concepts that might even help you understand or not understand you know, recent court decisions by the First Circuit. Um, I also want to show how issues of racial injustice have really shaped state of Maine Indian history and policy. That these uh, that racialization has been a, a key part of our experience as Wabanaki people, um, by in, in our treatment by the state of Maine, um, and I, I want to broad, provide this broad historical and sort of rights context of these contemporary issues um, that we continue to face in terms of um, our own uh, tribal sovereignty. The, here are some key dates. The, the, that, uh, the first few of them actually predate uh, the creation of the state of Maine, um, but they play into it in, in really important ways and, and are played out in a lot of the uh, context for uh, state of Maine Indian history and policy. Uh, the first is in 1790, U.S. Federal Non-Intercourse Act, making it illegal for non-federal parties to treaty with Indians. And then, I, of course, I detail a few <laughs> treaties. Uh, some of the really important ones um, from 1794, 1796, uh, 1818, um, calling 1818 a treaty. I think there's some debate about that. And then um, obviously the, the main state constitution, 1820, and then acts to re regulate Indians which start in the very first year of the creation of the state. Um, and then a series of court cases having to do with um, how we are treated uh, as Wabanaki people in lieu of our treaties and our role uh, and description of us in the US, in the main constitution. And then I do um, more so than other talks I've given, I also wanna bring this into the 20th century, talk about voting rights and our move towards um, um, uh, our settlement act in 1980 and sort of some of the context for that. Uh, for most of you, I don't have to necessarily go over this, but uh, the location of the tribal nations uh, in what is now called Maine, uh, sort of the residential sort of primary parts of this is not a map of our lands, of course, uh, which um, stretch uh, beyond these particular um, points. Um, so just in thinking about, you know, our, our role in our rights uh, as Wabanaki people in the context of the state of Maine. Uh, I do want to give you a couple of um, just thumbnail sketches of key concepts. The canons of treaty construction, um, the canons of Indian, uh, Indian canon of construction for treaties um, states three basic ideas that ambiguities are construed in favor of Indians. Um, number two is ambiguities are construed as the Indians would, under, have, would have understood them. And then number three, what is not expressly granted is retained. Um, these uh, are really critical uh, um, concepts to understand how, um, uh, what is supposed to happen in reviewing courts, um, although not necessarily in the First Circuit uh, recently. Um, another key topic, and this does have bearing uh, and continues to have bearing, I think, uh, into today, is treaty reserved rights. So anything in uh, treaties with Indians that is not um, ex explicitly taken away, um, uh, is uh, what's not expressly relinquished, is retained. And I think, you know, these this really is a really important part of sometimes um, people not initiated into the language of th this work will talk about things that are given Indians. And I am always correcting because I'm so fun at parties or whatever. Um, and I'm always correcting, no, actually, that's what we've retained. We weren't given um, these rights. We actually retained them. Um, and some of these rights uh, are retained through treaties. And then some of these are retained uh, through the fact that as tribal nations, we existed before the creation of the United States and our inherent sovereignty dates to before the United States and therefore also what's not expressly relinquished is retained. The state of Maine constitution, um, uh, Indians appear 
uh, in the original uh, constitution in a couple of different places. The first, and I think this is a very important, important place where, where uh, we appear is in Article 2, Section 1, uh, relating to electors who can vote. Of course, at that time, it was every male citizen of the US of the age of 21 years and upwards, excepting paupers, persons under guardianship, and Indians not taxed. So this notion of Indians not taxed has a really um, important um, history and context to it, and I'll and I'll um, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. But um, it, I I just want to it doesn't say Indians, right? Um, but it it. It, this Indians not tax language only appears in um, five states um, across the U.S. They're mostly in, in the East. Um, of course, today, this part of the Constitution states explicitly every Indian residing on tribal reservations and otherwise qualified shall be an elector in all county, state, and national elections. So I think that's a really important um, um, piece of this. Um, I'll get to some of the comments. There's some <laughs> already said. One good, one good uh, inquiry there. So this, this is one place where we appear as Indians in the, in the state constitution. Um, we also appear, and I'll, and I'll talk about this in a little bit, and this is, uh, forms the basis of the redact exhibit. Um, Article 10, section five, subsection five, talks about the state of Maine, assuming and performing all the duties and obligations of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts towards the Indians, whether the same arise from treaties or otherwise, and for this purpose shall obtain the assent of said Indians and their release of to this Commonwealth of claims and stipulations, et cetera, et cetera. So basically, this is the state of Maine promising to continue all the treaty and other obligations that the Commonwealth of Massachusetts had made with um, uh, the, the tribal nations here. So let me go a little bit deeper. Indians not taxed. Um, this, I mentioned it appears in a few other states' constitutions. It also appears in the U.S. Constitution in Article 1. Uh, Article 1, Section 2 of the Constitution talks again about uh, representation uh, shall be apportioned among several states according to their respective numbers, counting the whole number of persons in each state. There's also some three-fifths language I didn't <laughs> include here, excluding Indians not taxed. So Indians not taxed also appears in the U.S. Constitution from 31 years prior to the state constitution. Indians also appear in the U.S. Constitution in Article 1, Section 8, which talks about Congress being the only entity that regulates commerce with foreign nations and with Indian tribes. This is also known as the Indian Commerce Clause. So a little bit deeper on the context of Indians not taxed. Um, um, it also appears in the 14th Amendment. I, I cut some of that part out. Um, why is this included in the state constitution and, and, uh, and the US constitution? It first, it reflected first, and th these are pretty direct quotes from uh, the, uh, uh, what becomes sort of the, the first uh, handbook of federal Indian law um, uh, from the Department of Interior opinion of the solicitor from 1940. Um, this language reflects first the prevalent notion that taxation and representation should go hand in hand. So, the, the fact that it says Indians not tax, right? Why is that coming up and who votes? It's because of this notion that these are tied together. It reflected uh, also the fact that government taxation is the principal uh, criterion of governmental authority. And third, and this is very important, it, it recognizes the condition of the Indian living in his or her own separate and independent community. Right, Indians not tax means that they there is another governmental uh, status somewhere outside of this taxation representation game that is in the US and uh, state of Maine constitutions that is separate from. And so to me, this is a, a really explicit recognition of um, our separateness, our sovereignty, and um, um, just this formulation. It's not Indians not able to vote, right? It's Indians not taxed. Um, so again, this is because we did not, we're outside of this government, we do not bear, bear the financial burden, we are therefore not um, entitled to representation. Going deeper on 
the state uh, uh, constitution in um, the, the Articles of Separation um, part, where the redact <laughs> part of, of this talk. Um, so Maine separated from Massachusetts in 1820 during negotiations. Massachusetts demanded that Maine was responsible for obligations and treaty annuities in particular uh, was one of the important parts of this is sort of part of the budget of, of running a, a state, but also these uh, otherwise these treaty obligations and recognitions. Um, of course, beginning in January of 1876, the state of Maine began excluding Article 10, sections 1, 2, and 5, from which uh, these obligations uh, are clearly stated, from printed copies of the Maine Constitution. Section 5, of course, comprised of uh, these articles of separation, green on the condition to defend native treaties um, with, with Massachusetts, and actually implies heavily that in order to change, not only do the Indians need to agree to any changes, that the Commonwealth of Massachusetts would also have to agree to any changes in the treaties. And uh, thanks to uh, a bunch of people uh, who have worked on the redact, uh, I strongly urge you all to visit, uh, I, I believe there's some for, for form of the redact exhibit. Um, of course, section five remains in full force with the same effect as if it can, contained in all printed copies since. Um, but also, and, and we've explored this in, in a previous program, I think in a really uh, interesting and, and, and illuminating way, that the timing of this redaction indicates that Maine wished to obscure its obligations um, at the time uh, of this Granger versus Avery case, uh, which started you know, sometime before, but it became clear that in these cases, they did not want to have these obligations so explicit in the constitution and that they would be, you know, the state of Maine would be obligated to pay any illegal costs um, in terms of lost islands, islands uh, in this particular uh, uh, Passamaquoddy Islands reserved in treaties. Um, the, in, in, is particularly in the 1794 treaty with Massachusetts. So it allowed for, and there's some technical elements of the, of the legal ramifications of when things were executed and signed, but basically um, it, it, Maine was, uh, it ignored its liabilities at the same time it prohibited the printing of section five. So what does this all mean in sort of what, where, where do we go uh, into the 19th century? You know, I mentioned that these, uh, Indians not taxed uh, is good, right? In terms of recognizing our sovereignty or our separateness as as Indians in the context of the state of Maine, uh, the the Article Ten, you know, recognizes this ongoing obligation uh, for um, our treaty and, and other kinds of rights. Um, but this quickly turns, and and you know, I don't, I'm not going into it this evening, but you know, these very first set of laws. Um, uh, I, I put them in my um, second slide there, uh, starting in 1821, the state of Maine seeks to highly regulate uh, the actions and independence of Indians uh, in the state. And so there's this, and, and you know, eventually this, you know, um, you know the, the system uh, of, of Indian agents and control through in, and manipulation through Indian agents, people have talked about that. Um, but also this reflects this very racialized hierarchy that starts to firmly take hold in the 19th century quite quickly. So Indians not taxed, I have my suspicions that actually that was also in there for a variety of other reasons to um, allow for certain kinds of land seizures. But also we see this kind of language repeatedly in the 19th century. Um, in the most famous one, many of us have talked about it, is in Merch versus Tomer, which is actually a contract case uh, with uh, a Penobscot uh, tribal citizen. But the court is saying imbecility in this case, it's kind of dicta, but it, it really sets a tone for what the 19th century holds for us as Wabanaki people. Imbecility on there, the Indians part, in the dictates of humanity on ours have necessarily described to them their subjection to our paternal control in disregard of some, at least, of abstract principles of the rights of man. So much like the tension that 
uh, Corey Hinton talks about in uh, the, the Declaration of Independence um, and, and elsewhere in, our, uh, in the Begin Again exhibit, we see this tension of, oh, well, this is probably a violation of <laughs> rights of any of the rights we're talking about in any of our other founding documents, but it's because they're imbeciles and because we have this paternal control over them. Um, sometimes they say it's because of God or because of whatever. Um, but this is a clear expression of this hierarchy and paternalism. So, you know, what would otherwise be our separateness, Indians not taxed, treating us differently in the context of the state constitution, quickly becomes a category of otherness imbued with racial racial hierarchy. And that it really sets the tone for a very uh, a series of court decisions in the 19th century. So again, it becomes, quickly becomes racialized as a critical part of these interpretations. Um, it, the next major case um, that really um, twists this into a, a deeper and even more interesting angle is in uh, State versus Newell, which is a Passamaquoddy uh, hunting rights case, uh, respecting um, particularly treaty hunting rights. Here, um, the, the main Supreme Court uh, basically says, um, well, there are these treaties, we recognize them, and, but they refer to this entity called the Passamaquoddy tribe. And this is no longer, um, a tribe. They, they, they're not really a tribe anymore because they can, and the standard they use, this test that they invented just on the spot was they can no longer make war and peace and are therefore not the same entity that um, signed these treaties some, you know, 100 years earlier. Um, so even though, I mean, of course, this is, this is interesting. They say they're not a tribe, but they keep calling them the Passamaquoddy tribe in the, across in the case. Um, so interesting that they, and, and there's all this state law talking about the Passamaquoddy tribe at the time. And there's no sort of, you know, there's no precedent saying a tribe is an entity that must make war or peace, be able to make war or peace. And I'm not convinced, and I saw a couple of my Passamaquoddy um, relations here on, 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 this, uh, uh, on, on this Zoom. And I, I'm not, I think they could have made war. I'm not saying it necessarily would have, but making war or peace in the context of the state of Maine at this time, uh, I'm not sure. They, I mean, it might not have been successful, but what, what would prevent them from actually making war? Um, I'm not so sure. So this case, um, which just makes up rules on the spot, uses the paternalism, leans into the paternalistic control and saying, we can decide one, what, however we want and make up any kind of uh, dictate, um, you know, really drives home this sort of removal uh, and, and silencing of tribal um, uh, rights uh, and, and uh, in the 19th century. In this, in this case, and others like it in the context of Maine, um, main uh, law, ignored all the federal Indian law cases and concepts, the, the, the concepts I laid out for you, these uh, canons of construction, retained rights, and really leaned into the Indian as a second class citizen with no rights, we couldn't manage our own resources, we couldn't vote, um, and really these sort of racialized terms. But of course, it was this approach, ignoring all sense of federal law, the US Constitution, uh, and even the, the, the dictates in the state constitution that led to um, the Passamaquoddy v. Morton case in 1972, which leads to the Maine Indian Claims Settlement Act in 1980. Um, so let, before I get on the continuation of that, I kind of want to take a little bit of uh, a break, a reformulation. One of the things that's really frustrating and calling out the legacy and ongoing impact of these words and deeds uh, on us as Wabanaki people is that sometimes our agency gets gets lost in this equation. And so I wanted to share a little bit of a story. It relates to um, eventually voting and, and things like that. But I want to just tell one of these sort of, you know, is it true? I think it's, you know, mostly true, a story about one of um, um, 
uh, one of these amazing Wabanaki women uh, from our past named Lucy Nicole Arpula. So I just want to tell you a little bit uh, about her and it connects with some very interesting history. And it is also it shows you the kinds of agency that we as Wabanaki people um, continue to have had all along and continue to have. In January of 1900, uh, Lucy Nicolar, also known as Princess Watawaso, visited, or so the story goes, the Women's Debating Society in New York City. At the end of a lively discussion about immigration, the debaters resolved that it was dangerous and threatening to all true Americans, right? This could have happened a couple in the last couple of years. Immigration, you know, illegal immigration. These are the dangers that we face as true Americans, um, right? So that was the, the dictates of that particular debating society. And according to this journalist who wrote about the event, Lucy took their conclusion as her cue. She rose to speak in her stately form, as noted by the reporter, commanding instant recognition. She says, I believe I am the only true American here. I think you have decided rightly. Of all my forefathers' country from the St. John River to the Connecticut, we have but a little island one half mile square. There are only about 500 of us now. We are very happy on our island, but we are poor. The railroad corporations, which did their share of robbing us of our land, are now begrudging, uh, begrudging us half rate fare. But we forgive you all. Well, that, there was a long silence and the subject was laid on the table. The president of the society said that the musical feature would have to be omitted as the pianist was sick and asked, would someone please volunteer? Again, according to the reporter, no one had the courage to try an impromptu before that large audience. At last, who should beg to be allowed to try? But what a wasso who played some selections from Chopin with the greatest ease and sang a plaintive air which touched the hearts of all those present and made them feel like doing anything in the world. I find this story to be both compelling and fanciful and, you know, this, this trope of Indian women being these sort of um, giving to anyone uh, with this wry sense of humor. There's, a, there's, a, there's some tropes in here that make me question the quote, uh, the, the total accuracy of this, but it does show you, um, the spaces that we have engaged all along to put forward our perspective as Wabanaki people. Uh, and I think these are really, really powerful. Um, this notion of Indians not taxed ultimately gets resolved legally. And this has to do with some other, other tribes and other, other uh, locations in, in the United States. Um, but in 1924, there's the Native American Citizenship Act, which was originally proposed, started being proposed in the, in the years 1917, 1918. Um, but even with the citizenship um, in Maine and many other states, we were not uh, granted the right to vote in either state or federal elections. Um, but also Native people in recognition and preservation of our sovereignty refused to give up um, really re reject this notion of kind of a forced citizenship. Um, the Abbey Museum has this great um, rendering uh, of the, and I'll, and I'll show you what it is, um, but this Passamaquoddy uh, tribal petition to, uh, in 1920, to Maine Governor Carl Milliken to support the tribe's exemption from this forced U.S. citizenship. Um, and sort of, why, why would that be? Um, and so this is the language uh, that appears at the Abbey and, and elsewhere. We, the undersigned members of the Passamaquoddy tribe of Indians humbly beg the state of Maine to use her influence against making Indian citizens of the US for the following reasons. We are satisfied with our lot as Indians and we've been loyal. There's Colonel Allen there. Colonel Allen comes up in a, in a different, couple of different places as, as well in redact exhibit and begin again. Um, talks about their loyalty and service uh, of Passamaquoddy men in fighting in these uh, wars uh, to help Americans, but we want to maintain our separateness, our, our lot as Indians, and we should be exempt from this, from this law. 
I, I find that really interesting. And I think it's a very important um, element to this. In the 1940s, there are the first attempts to overcome this um, issue of voting by uh, uh, tribal uh, folks uh, living on reservations. Um, in 1941, a bill titled, and, and I'm taking this directly from, from uh, Donna Loring, who I think I saw on this. So thank you, Donna, for finding some of this evidence. Um, in 1941, uh, this an act permitting Indians to vote in state elections presented before the legislature, um, which also proposed a poll tax for Indians to vote. And um, even though we had been made citizens, um, uh, the, the Supreme Judicial Court refused to even consider it, said that it was inherently illegal and insufficient. It was withdrawn from consideration. So I find it also interesting that this notion that we suddenly have poll taxes, which existed in uh, other states with other racialized populations in 1941, um, the idea that they would reject it uh, even uh, as a way, as a pathway for voting by Indians is also interesting. Um, and this is, there's a dynamic in, in terms of our agency, again, that after World War II, Native veterans uh, and others made delegations to the US House of Representatives and to the United Nations calling attention to our condition uh, as, as, um, as, as tribal peoples. And, um, you know, this starts to ebb the flow. You know, I think this, this uh, form of activism of which Lucy um, and others are critical, um, um, purveyors of, you know, this really drives home sort of our actions for our rights, you know, especially in, in this time in the mid 20th century. Finally, in 1954, uh, we were finally allowed to vote in federal elections at the time, uh, then, um, in the state of Maine. And look, it's Lucy again, casting the first vote. Um, and she was involved in so many things, both for community well-being and, and activism and entertainment. She's really amazing. I, I strongly urge you all to, to read up about her. Really amazing, amazing person. Um, and then full enfranchisement finally happens in 1967 when uh, the Indians living on reservations could vote in state elections and have state representation. One of the sort of major episodes of this policy history has to do with in, in 1942 with the with this thing called the Proctor Report. Um, and again, this is, you know, Donna and I strong you um, uh, strong you all to read Donna's book uh, from 2004 in the shadow of the eagle. I hope I got that name right. Um, that you know, here in the in this Proctor report, which was you know commissioned by and large by the state to understand the status of Indians, um, it it very clearly demonstrates that we as tribal uh, folks grew up believing that we were paupers and totally dependent on the state. Like that was the 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 role of the Indian agent was to communicate that, and that even when we were asking for our own money, our own resources that were due to us, we were made to literally beg for our own stuff. Um, that as Indians, we were not aware, uh, were not aware that the goods and services um, were actually our money. Um, and that the state of Maine, and this is in, in the report, stole tribal lands and resources and impounded the trust and uh, the trust fund monies during World War II to pay for state expenses incurred by World War II, totally draining the trust fund uh, of, of its money at the time. There are so many, the language in this report um, and sort of uh, that sort of fill in for what's supposed to be, I think, you know, social scientific language is completely racist, of course, um, talking about the Indian not you know, quitting after their first paycheck, um, unwilling to exert ourselves mentally in school, that we're shiftless, that we don't take care of our houses or ourselves or our land, even though we were the ones that taught you all how to bathe and all that other stuff. So there's a very, very deep kind of um, racist kind of legacy and paternalism, even in this Proctor report, despite where you can read some very horrific kind of confessions in it as well in terms of the state of Maine's treatment. 
um, things start to really shift and I think in a more objective and nuanced way with this um, 1974 civil rights report. Um, um, and sort of the, it's from the main, invi main advisory committee to the US Commission on Civil Rights. Um, and there was a, a number of uh, other folks um, of color in the state of Maine that were collaboratively with, with, with tribal people to establish this report, make it happen and publicize it. And this is a really important uh, sort of, you know, expression of the status of Indians at, at the time. And I'll just go into a couple of small things. One of them has to do with unemployment. Um, so unemployment rates um, among Maine Indians um, uh, in the report we see is so high in 1973 that they formed sort of a, a class unequaled in any of the D Department of Labor statistics estimated that on reservation, unemployment was anywhere between 60 and 80 percent, 60 percent at Penobscot, 70% at the two Passamaquoddy reservations. For off-reservation Indians, approximately 50% unemployed. And this unemployment rate among all Indians still kind of being uh, at best estimates at that time, 65%. The, um, this is uh, some 2012 statistics uh, around employment and I, Believe me, I have I have a point in comparing these two things. You know, of course, this is after the the Passamaquoddy v. Morton case, the, after the Settlement Act, after uh, federal recognition. Um, there's still this ongoing legacy of higher unemployment rates amongst. Here you can see in 2012, Passamaquoddy and Wabanaki people in general, 20 percent, 16 percent, Washington County. Um, um, I'm sorry, 28% Passamaquoddy, 21% um, Oabanaki, and then uh, in Washington County, 10%, and then at the state of Maine and at the time, 8% unemployment. So still large disparities, but nothing like um, the early 70s. Um, and then also from the main uh, Wabanaki state child welfare statistics ad that, are, that are in the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's uh, final report, um, Indian children in Maine, you know, were placed in foster care at hugely high rates, you know, in the, in the early 70s uh, in particular, 25, 20 times higher than non-Indian children, 19 times higher. Um, for Roosick County in 1972, the rate of removal for Indian children was 62 times higher than the statewide rate for non-Indian children. Um, in the TRC's report, uh, between 2000 and 2013, this rate is five times the rate of non-native children. Still a crazy amount higher than non-native children, but so much less than previous, uh, previous um, uh, statistics. Um, I could go on and, and, and honestly, I, uh, I kind of want to get <laughs> to q and I've been kind of ignoring the chat in the Q&A just to, so I could uh, sort of finish up the story. I, what I will say is that these legacies of paternalism, racism, and state control have been horrible for us as Wabanaki people. Um, I think, you know, and, and statistics bear this out, of course, federal recognition, the Settlement Act have made things better there are still these huge disparities. And honestly, if you look, I'm a researcher, if you look anywhere around the country to try to understand these things, our sovereignty not only benefits us, right, as a form of recognition, but also benefits the, the state more broadly. Um, you know, the kinds of partnerships that can truly happen um, when our sovereignty is recognized um, by our, um, state partners, I'll just in a positive way say that, is a, is, is a win for everyone. And, and I really, you know, if we want to talk about some of the proposed legislation, we can do some of that. But I really do think our role as Wabanaki people in the state of Maine um, um, must be more central um, and it, it will benefit uh, all of us. So um, I guess that's where I will stop. I'll try to stop my share here and yeah.
don't know if people can see me now. Thank you so much, Darren. Um, we are getting a lot of questions from the audience, if you're ready for those now. I am. And thank you all for coming tonight. There's a lot of people. I mean, I'm seeing even just some conversations and um, my uh, my friend Lakota already answering some of them for for uh, for folks. And um, yeah, there's there's a lot of expertise and and um, um, uh, my friend Dwayne Toma said he was coming tonight and I see you here. So any of these questions. Whatever you, whatever you think, Kathleen, where right. should I go? We'll start with uh, this question in the Q&A. Do you know how uh, the First Circuit Court justified their decision against the Penobscot Nation in the Penobscot River case in light of the canons of construction? The Penobscots never agreed to give jurisdiction over to the river to the state of Maine. Um, yeah, do I know? how they justified it. I, I do know how they justified it. Um, so a couple of things. Um, so the the recent um, uh, en banc um, decision that, that reinforced the previous First Circuit decision and, and used mostly the same, same logic, um, expanded on it a little bit of the previous decision. Uh, the First Circuit basically says there are no, I mean, they basically say there are no ambiguities. So remember one of the, the, the canons of construction had to do with ambiguities, you know, interpreted in these ways. So they, you know, they go and look at a, um, a dictionary definition of island, for example, and they're like, oh, well, island says this, it doesn't include water. Um, and then they ignore, of course, that there are already in the Settlement Act um, kind of different definitions going on, but they're like, oh, Pshaw, you know, even with that, <laughs> we're gonna just say it's the text is the text. It says island, doesn't say water. Um, I I think um, you know the and and the dissent agrees with with me, <laughs> which is to say that um, again, there's no explicit. They they can't point to, and this is very interesting. They can't point to an explicit moment in time where we as the Penobscot Nation gave up any water rights um, either. I mean, they're basically saying it's not explicitly a part of the retained and definition of a reservation in uh, an act that was meant to settle a land dispute. Um, but nor can they point to an explicit giving up of this. Um, and they ignore a bunch of different parts of history. They say they use this, this, this basic logic that is the weight of history. You know, no one really would have thought um, that, you know, you know, the state of Maine has always acted like it was their river, even though that's not true, uh, yeah. you know, up until, you know, basically from the mid 1980s until 2012 and, and Schneider issued this opinion, they were seeing it as kind of a concurrent jurisdiction in game. So they're like, they kind of, you know, leave that history out. They leave out this history of, you know, after Passamaquoddy v. Morton, as we win these court cases, also the his, that history from 72 to 80, where the recognition of our inherent tribal sovereignty and our rights over our lands and resources is being recognized again and again, not only in federal court, but in state court because of this, um, we haven't, we hadn't explicitly given it up. So they really use this sort of whole cloth and Chief Francis is really good at articulating this, that we, um, we, uh, you know, somehow we, after winning all these court cases in the 70s, that we turn around in 1980 and decide, you know, with this plain language, apparently, we decide, oh, we'll just give up so much of this, including our own uh, water and river and all this. It makes no sense. Um, but, you know, I also think it's interesting to use the sort of weight of history argument. You saw the paternalistic control, right, in these, in these histories, like, the official documentation of things, right, has been all along, you know, you know, some court just saying, you're no longer a tribe, you know, just, we're calling you the Passamaquoddy tribe, but you're like, so this sort of justification that sort of the might makes right, you know, mm -hmm. troll over the discourse is therefore an argument for somehow we lost something in that, in that racist um, game. So 
obviously I have very strong opinions <laughs> uh, about about this, um, but I'll stop there for now. Um, and uh, I'm sure there could be other more questions. questions. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Another question. It would appear that Massachusetts was more sympathetic with the rights of Indians prior to Maine statehood than Maine was after 1820. If true, how would you account for that difference? You know, I don't know if that's, I, I think um, it's, it's, it's complicated. Mm -hmm. You could make the argument that, you know, in that moment, <laughs> you know, maybe they were, maybe they weren't. Um, Massachusetts does some pretty dubious things in the 19th century as well to their mm -hmm. Indians, to the, their Indians, whatever. You know, they're the, the, the tribal nations that are, you know, in Massachusetts. Um, they also ignore federal uh, Indian law in dramatic ways. They also um, start to seize property at different times. You know, there's a whole history of in Mashpee of, of these land deals where, you know, it, it gets, you know, gradually kind of taken over time. Um, so I, I think it's, you know, I think that's, I'd be reluctant to say, yay, Massachusetts, they get a gold star for their treatment of Indians because right. there's a lot of dubious things that happened also in their 19th century. Um, but I think, um, you know, part of this, there's two dynamics I think going on. Massachusetts basically wants to kind of rid themselves of the Indian problem <laughs> in Maine. For, so right, so, even when Massachusetts says to Maine, when, when their yeah. is happening, it's not so much a, like a, a place of benevolence, like now you have to promise to honor Correct. treaties because that's the right thing. It could be more of a, this isn't our problem anymore. Yeah, but that's correct. That's Maine's problem now. That is correct. And, you know, comparatively, and, and this is something that Massachusetts had struggled with, right, in terms of perhaps distance, perhaps other things, you know, even in 1820, the vast majority of Maine as land um, was still kind of Wabanaki space. It, you know, mm -hmm. if you look at, you know, so they, they really did not want to have to sort of deal with some complicated, protracted sort of, you know, they, of course they had, you know, made up all these treaties and there's a really dubious, this sort of 1818 Penobscot Treaty, which, you know, where we lose so much land on either side of the Penobscot River. Um, it's just really, really, um, fraudulently kind of put through this um, uh, in, in eventually into the state legislature um, um, as sort of captured in 1820 at, at the beginning of the state of Maine, that these, these episodes are just, um, you know, uh, I love the musical Hamilton, um, but what's revealed probably in that and in, in subtle ways is that these founders were all basically land speculators, right? Um, whose land? Indian land, right? So they're all speculating. Um, and this is sort of the founders and I strongly urge uh, people to, to, um, um, to find the series I've been participating with uh, on Donna Loring's radio show um, about the sort of, you know, uh, 18th and 19th century kind of context to the state of Maine, state of Massachusetts, state of Maine, uh, Wabanaki um, relations, um, that there's this, this really, um, extraordinary kind of and dubious fraudulent set of characters just looking for um, 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 land to, to seize and develop. You know, people, the founders of Bowdoin College are in there um, seizing tracts of land, you know, even this legacy of tracts of land handed over to people because of the scalp bounties. You know, these are all interwoven histories of this land speculation uh, set of deals. So it is, it, it, you know, I always find with Indian history, <laughs> Native American history, you know, the official policies are horrible, but then even what we retain as Indians in the attempts at which um, um, that the, the settlers go to to get even the land that we're like left with and extract from us and and, and through these paternalistic kind of means of control are just also equally, if not more so horrific. Another guest says, uh, I was wondering what you thought about how racism is perpetrated against native peoples 
by those who identify with, in quotes, progressive liberal politics, um, a group of folks who claim to stand for um, racialized peoples in their talking points. Ooh, Lakota, my friend. Um, I think there are a couple of things. Um, I think this is a really, really interesting question. Um, you know, let's say, let's say someone <laughs> who might be a governor of our state previously was a, uh, an attorney general, right? Um, sometimes these liberal uh, progressive politics, um, you know, take on the notion, especially with tribal uh, nations, take on a kind of um, real abstract notion of equality and, and, and that leaves out um, a notion of justice. So for example, you know, there was this back and forth in the legislature a few years ago, trying to kind of sort out the, the Alver licensing issues. Um, and at the time, the legislature tried to reach a compromise with the tribes. And that was almost a done deal. And then the attorney general, who's now our governor, basically said like any of these laws that treat you know, tribes as different than other tribal people, as different than other people in the state, violates the 14th Amendment, right? So basically the equal protection clause of the 14th Amendment, mm -hmm. like all, everyone should be treated equally under the law. Um, so these are, these are quote unquote progressive tactics to disabuse these legacies of our treaty rights, these legacies. So really using this kind of, um, notion of equal protection under the law to remove any of the retained rights that we have because, uh, because, because of who we are as, as tribal nations. Um, I think that's just one part of it. I have a feeling Lakota has <laughs> uh, other, other forms of this, but I think that in the, the overall homogenization um, that can happen um, too and when different racialized um, groups of people get kind of blended together and we get kind of put into this, what I consider a very capitalistic uh, scheme around uh, you know, diversity, equity, and inclusion work. Um, I think it can lose a lot of what is a transformational and needed in terms of justice when we start to just start to merely play, you know, identity language games. So for me, I'm about justice. I almost wore my land back t-shirt uh, underneath my more formal shirt, but I figured I couldn't quite get the right angle on, on that. But so I think it can ob uh, sometimes obfuscate what justice is. What do you think is the most important thing for Maine children to learn to support a better, more respected future for the Wabanaki? Yeah, and you know, I thought a lot about this. Um, my involvement in the, the main Indian history and culture law referred to as LD 291 um, over many years. I think, I think children, Maine's children can know the truth of our history uh, first and foremost, and you know how, you know, basic, answering basic questions of, hey, where did your land come from? And how these are very dubious episodes uh, to create, you know, the state of Maine in terms of the land. Um, but also, you know, uh, I believe, so truth telling is very important. I think we underestimate what children can actually comprehend. I, I think the, 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 the notion that um, there is, you know, uh, what we've retained as Wabanaki tribal nations and what we seek in terms of our rights is actually not only for the betterment of ourselves as Wabanaki people, but is, in my opinion, and I think in a lot of our opinions, is better for everyone in the state. Um, that I think a lot of fear and uncertainty um, comes from uh, the other side, the folks who do not support our sovereignty. Um, I think the, uh, uh, I think in the back, and I think this is, you know, why, it's so difficult to teach some of this because 
I don't think the people who are against our rights and sovereignty, you know, th they often say, oh, we have questions or we're concerned it will create ambiguities. We're actually in one of the most ambiguous kind of tribal Indian law <laughs> contexts in the whole country. That's why there are all these lawsuits all the time. Normalizing our sovereignty along the other um, several hundred tribes uh, would actually create more certainty. And would actually, you know, benefit a whole host again, every all of us. Um, but I, you know, I think people aren't sure why they're against it. Um, I think some of this is, you know, if they have more rights, maybe they'll do to us what we did to them. I still think there's this sort of fear around that, um, and um, or and or there's this notion that um, they just don't trust us. You know that we don't. Um, we don't earn their trust um, that we would act in such a way that would benefit, despite our thousands of years of presence in uh, on along this <laughs> continent on this land, um, stewarding it, um, taking care of it, being living in relationship to, to um, each other and non-humans and and the newcomers, all of this. I, I don't know where the, the, the mistrust comes from. Um, but I think that's 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 for them to answer. But I do think mm -hmm. those are the those are the responses. Um, I, I think, you know, anyway, <laughs> I could go on. But I think it's just it's 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 still shocking and, and it it um, to me when I hear people not supporting it. It it doesn't make sense to me. Another question, uh from a guest in the audience. Um, they're talking, they're referencing, a, I believe this must be a case, Johnson v. McIntosh, 1823. Are you fam familiar? I, I am, Dwayne, asking the Johnson v. McIntosh question. Thank you so much, Dwayne. So good, uh, I, I can see you, <laughs> yeah. Do First Nations people, do First Nations people actually own land or a right to occupy? I believe he's asking in, in reference to that case. Yeah, so Johnson v. McIntosh is basically a, um, a case that brings in the doctrine of Christian discovery and domination into uh, federal Indian law. It had been kind of hinted at in a number of other places. And the doctrine of Christian discovery and domination does not recognize the possibility of uh, indigenous people owning our land completely. Um, as a part of our retained rights to land. Unless we have a treaty or a recognized form of title with a European Christian nation. There's a whole other set of things and in one minute, I'm not gonna be able to get at it, but the, the, the elements of what I describe as racialized hierarchy in the 19th century were formulated and established in uh, a religious hierarchy which divided nations across the world um, as Christian and non-Christian and basically saying the non-Christians have don't have the same they're not even there if they are human they're barely human they don't have the same elements of of um, right uh, that we do as Christian and Christian nation so using Christianity as a form of domination uh, and, and 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 right to control but Dwayne is what he's hinting at is 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 correct you know in terms of indigenous title in that system of American and, and other Commonwealth countries as well, that our rights, retained rights to land tend to be uh, rights of, of occupancy, rights of use and interpreted in courts that way. That doesn't disabuse that, you know, what that means is then this sort of uncomfortable, you know, do we have full territorial control. Well, as sovereign entities, we do. Why does the federal government own our lands in trust for us? That's still an ongoing legacy of that occupancy, needing a sovereign to fully protect or own the lands that we as sovereigns control. Again, I'm over time. There's a lot more to it. There are lawyers out here, hopefully not on the call, because then they could really nail me. But I appreciate the, the question, Dwayne. Great. Great, great that you could be here. Well, thank you so much, uh, Darren, and thank you to the audience for being here, for your participation, uh, and for your questions.
I hope that uh, for those of you that haven't had a chance to visit uh, Begin Again, uh, the exhibit at Maine Historical Society, uh, you can visit in person or online. Please visit mainhistory.org to learn more, um, to see 2D and 3D versions of the exhibit, to buy your tickets to visit in person. Uh, Dr. Ranko was one of the co-curators of that exhibit. Uh, and we would, we would love for you, if you're interested in learning more on this topic, uh, to please visit however you can. And uh, Dr. Ranko is going to join us again in August for our next uh, Historians Forum on August 7th. Um, so if you would like to hear more from him and from some other uh, historians, again, you can visit mainhistory.org to register for that program and for other upcoming programs and to see the recording of this and other past programs. Uh, Dr. Renko, was there anything else that you wanted to uh, say before we close this evening? No, everyone be well. Uh, please support Wabanaki tribal sovereignty in whatever ways you can. It's very important, as you heard me say. Thank you very much. Have a good evening, everybody. Good night.